It's good to be here. Um, last time we were here, we were at Christmas Day, and on Christmas Eve, there was a load of people out there. Wasn't that good? Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. That was a good gathering, wasn't it? And it's just so good to see so many people at Carson, just gathering to sing some good, godly songs together. Uh, and I'm going to keep praying and keep praying, Lord, just keep touching those people, keep reaching out, keep yeah. helping them to remember us, a word from a a word from a carol or a, uh, something Matt said or something on the flyer, or just to, yeah. We need to keep praying for God's power, don't we? To keep coming up. It's God's word to us this morning through through Ken. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for you this morning. When did you last change your mind about something? When did you last change your mind? Okay. Oh, very good. Praise God. Worth listening to God. Um, I said, what would I last change my mind? I think it was in 1989. <laughs> Since then, I've been faithful to everything I believe and I haven't changed. I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain thing, a virtue in being resolute in the things that we believe. I, you know, I do believe that. <laughs> but you get sort of stuck, can't you, in, in the way we think about things. I was thinking, when did I last change my mind? When I was, when I was, when I was playing football, you, know, you used to have five at the front, Three in the middle and two at the back. Five, three, two. That's how you play football. Oh, no, no. Now you have flat back fours and you have four at the back and you keep changing them around. Oh, wow. What's all that about? I changed my mind next on Christmas Day. We were with Richard and Anna and there was Yorkshire pudding with turkey. I thought, Yorkshire pudding with turkey? Where did that come from? <laughs> Yorkshire pudding with roast beef. What are you up to, Richard? Actually, it was quite nice. Oh, it does go off. <laughs> she hasn't changed her mind yet. <laughs> we cling on to things, don't we? You know, something like, I mean, a bit more seriously, you know, Revelation is not primarily about the end of time. I thought it was. And I listened to a guy called Ian Paul, and he said, no, no, no. It's primarily a letter to some persecuted Christians, and he's trying to encourage them by giving them a great a vision of a great sweep of history. Oh, right, okay, right. But it's just a little bit of resetting there. Okay, anybody else? Would you like volunteers about when they last changed their mind? Think about it. Think about it. Okay, I just want to pick up on something Dan said uh, before, before Christmas when he, when he spoke, and he encouraged us that Paul was encouraging the Philippians to change their mindset. Previously, they let, they, he said they were leaving, uh, living as enemies of Christ. Um, and he's saying, I now want you to not set your mind on earthly things, but instead set your mind on the things of heaven. He was looking for a mindset change. Do you remember that from the beginning of December? Model, mindset, motivation. Dan's very good at actually, sort of leaving single words, and then you sort of go away, and a month later you think, oh, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. And they're quite, they're, he's, he's very helpful like that. Um, and uh, verse 18, uh, Paul said, uh, we're in chapter, by the way, we're in Philippians. Chapter four. <laughs> we we actually we did we did feel the Holy Spirit helped us change our mind. We did feel we were going through this a bit quickly. Actually, and Craig said there were about three sermons in this book, and then, and then and Dan said the same thing. So okay, let's just slow down a bit. So we're going to go through this last chapter a bit more slowly, a bit more at a different, slightly different pace. Holy Spirit says keep. Pace, keeping step of the Spirit, we're trying to do that. Um, uh, so verse 18, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Uh, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory and their shame, and their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. He's saying, I want you, Philippians, to change your mindset. Not on the things you're pursuing, whether it's being a great Jew, like I used to do, said Paul, or whether it was on sort of, you know, uh, more carnal things that you're setting your minds on. He said, I want you to shift your mindset to think the citizens of heaven. So that's where we're going to be going over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, and uh, so today we're going to be looking at three verses. 
so glad to have my yours included. Um, so, um, just back off a bit. Uh, and um, just a little note, if I just go forward, go forward to there. Okay, so let me read our passage this morning. But our, this is where Dan left us off. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. That, that's where we're looking at this morning. Now, just a little technical, little technical uh, thing. You'll see that whoever put the verses on these, this passage, obviously it's not written in the verses, um, but whenever it was in the, during the Reformation or before that, um, Verse 21 ends um, where it does, and then mysteriously chapter 4 starts. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for. And most versions then have a heading, as if there's another section coming exhortation, encouragement, and prayer. Can you see that? And then you go on a new setting about Euodia and Sinti. There's a bit of debate, really, where that verse 4 1 stands. Because if you look at commentaries, they then tend to look at verse 4, chapters 1 to 3, there's one bit, you admit, but here they put it on the end of that, and when, Paul, when, when Dan preached, he stuck it on the end. So a, and if you look at commentaries, they sort of shift it round, so there's a, bit of, there's a bit of debate as to where that verse goes. Um, and it, it is quite important, actually, because if it comes at the end, therefore my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm. Thus in the Lord. Stand firm because you're citizens of heaven and Jesus is coming back and he's returning and knowing that, stand firm. And that's right, that's true, isn't it? Knowing that Jesus is coming back, it gives us the courage to take our stand because the future's looked up. Yeah? However, if you flip it round, therefore my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the, in the Lord my beloved, and he's talking about the next bit that's coming, which are five ways of standing firm in the Lord. He looks at maintaining our unity, which we're looking at this morning. Then a bit about trusting God in our anxieties. Then carefully guarding our minds. Then a bit about embracing our circumstances. And then trusting God for our provision. Okay? Are you with me on that? I'm suggesting that we sort of take the second, second way of interpreting it. Here are five ways of standing firm in the Lord, yeah? As citizens of heaven. Five ways you can do it. Maintaining unity with one another, trusting God with our anxieties, carefully guarding our minds, embracing our circumstances, and trusting God for our provision. So this is why we sort of slowed down a bit. Okay. Let's just take a bit of a pause here. What does it mean to live as a citizen of heaven? In the realities of 21st century life in Carston. And those are five, I would suggest those are five things that good citizens of heaven do. Yeah? And we're going to be looking at the first one today, which is maintaining our unity with one another. <laughs> and uh, this phrase, citizens of heaven, is this sense of actually our citizenship belongs somewhere else. It comes from somewhere else. Just go back a bit. Oh, this is working so well. Because actually, we are citizens in a foreign land. This earthly realm in which we live, because we've been born again from above, <coughs> is not our natural habitat. I don't know whether you've ever thought about that. Peter said this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. What does he mean by that? You're sojourners <coughs> and exiles. 
He wasn't talking of them geographically. You're living in Greece when actually you come from Africa. He didn't mean that. He said, no, 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 no. You, your, your real realm, the realm of life, is a heavenly realm. You've been born again, or you've been born from above. And because of that, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. It's a similar idea that Paul picked up when he spoke to the Philippians, saying, you're living as enemies of Christ. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. And glorify God on the day of visitation. In other words, the Gentiles, the unbelievers, when they see the Christians behaving well, behaving in a godly manner, behaving in a heavenly manner, they say, oh, there's something of God here, there's a hint of heaven in the way these people are conducting themselves. Yeah? That's quite a tall order, isn't it? And yet, do you know what? That's what we're called to. That is what we got. That's the high calling we have to live as citizens of heaven, live in a heavenly way, outworking the Beatitudes in this environment. Yeah? Paul was writing to these Philippians, and these Philippians, as we've already as we've, as we looked at, were living in a Roman colony. Philippi looked to Rome for a lead. Philippi was full of, we've said this before, ex-Roman soldiers. Philippi prided itself on being a colony of Rome. We, we looked to Rome for our lead. And the Rome, and, but actually, Philippi was some way from Rome. But nevertheless, we're a Roman colony. And Paul comes along and said, well, actually, you're not. You're members of a colony of heaven, also some way away. And you're really citizens of heaven. So in the, in the colony of Rome, live as if you're in a colony of heaven. Yeah? Among citizens of Rome, live as citizens of heaven. I just love that. I think it's such a vision, such a vision for how we should live amongst those who don't know Christ, that in seeing that, maybe some will come to know Christ. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. And give glory to God in heaven on the day of visitation. Yeah? That, this takes a little bit of unpacking, which is why we're going to go slowly. Yeah? Does that help us where we're going over the next five weeks? Yeah? We're looking at, we're trying to open up what this means to live as a citizen of heaven in an earthly, earthly environment. Some of you looking around are citizens of, are born in another country. Heaven or Rene. Jenny. Denver, Aggie, <laughs> Ken, yeah, we have a quite good international rep in representation here, don't we? You know what it's like, freedom, <laughs> Ghana, you know what it's like to live as a foreigner in this country, you're nodding, yeah, I really do, <coughs> you English don't really understand that, that's probably true. But actually, we are all exiles and foreigners from heaven. Yeah? Okay. Philippians, just going to look at two verses. And suddenly, we come from heaven to earth in this passage. You are citizens of heaven, and then he talks about these two squab squabbling ladies. That's a pretty big jump from heaven to earth. Yeah? I entreat you, you O dear, and I treat you, Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Just two short verses. Two ladies have had an argument. They've fallen out about something, and we don't know what it is. I think Paul kept it deliberately hidden. But I do feel a little bit sorry for these two. They are forever remembered in history. There's two women who had an argument. 
And do you know what? Actually, it's two women. It could just as easily have been two men. There's nothing special about two women having an argument. Two women do argue, but you might have noticed. So do men. It just happens to be women. <laughs> Does that make you feel better, ladies? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> and you know, Paul knows what he's talking about. He had two spectacular fallings out in the scriptures. One with John Mark, who was a young man who wasn't quite up to scratch, and Paul said, I'm not taking him on the next journey. And the other was Peter, and they argue about circumcision and things like that. He actually made it up with both of them. <coughs> Mark gets really, really cerebrated, and he and Peter and Paul get on with each other in the end. So he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, and they, have, they are described as having laboured side by side with me in the gospel. <coughs> These are full-on Christians who had a spot. They were part of this mission team to Philippi. Their names are written in the Book of Life. But they still had a score. Um, and it seems to be, and it's probably a long-standing argument they've had, the very fact that Paul's heard about it, somebody's told him about it, the whole church probably knew about it. And somebody said to Paul, what are we doing about this? So Paul gives us some advice. And it seems to be a specific fractured relationship that he's talking about, but actually I think it has some universal applications. So I just want to say quickly three things about this. Oh, sorry, that was just about a mindset change. I think I've dealt with that. Uh, that's Romans 12, 2. Not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. God wants us to change our minds about it. Okay. Question number one, if you're taking notes, all relationships can suffer damage. These two, two formerly godly women, women taking part in the, in, in the spread of the gospel, name written in the book of life, yet they fall out. That's quite a sobering thought. Do <laughs> you think, well, my good friend X or Y will never have an argument. You know, we, we definitely are BFF. Best friends forever. <laughs> Yeah, we are very we, we have we have we are very we are very blessed. We have five little granddaughters. We love them to bits. Age between two months and seven, they talk about BFF. And I'm thinking, you mean you really mean many? You really mean BFTW? Do you? Best friends this week. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, best friends BFT, best friends today. But actually. That's the first thing. All relationships can, can, uh, can be fractured, can suffer damage. Um, and do you know, I, I just want to stop at that, because we have some pressure. Everybody in this room will have a pressure function. Well, I hope you've got pressure function. But actually, they're not invulnerable. They're really not. And we do need to take care of our relationships and tend them and give them time and give them effort and reconcile things quickly because they're precious. The body of Christ is made up of members who love each other, but love is a, is a, is a vulnerable quality. Can anybody tell me where this verse comes from? Catch the little, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are impossible. One of the Gospels? <coughs> Song of Solomon. It comes in Song of Solomon. That lovely book about the delights of early marriage. For our vineyards are in blossom. The blossom speaks of promise, speaks of fruit to come. These are two lovers who got married, looking forward to marry together, marriage together. And there's a little warning here. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes. The little things that get in the way of our relationship. The little things that damage friendship. And, uh, and that's, that's how it is, isn't it? It's the little things that can get in the way. It's the little things that can damage our relationships. And these two Euodian Syntyche, what has happened here? They haven't called the little fox. They'd allowed something to get into their relationship to break the agreement between them. And something nasty got in 
and fractured their relationship such that it needed an apostle to come and help to deal with it. It, it is sad, isn't it, when our relationships get fractured? And we've probably all been through that at some point. I have a dear friend who, or had a dear friend, who was instrumental in me in, in, in me coming to Christ in the first place. It was a really valuable friendship. Sadly, as far as I can gather, he's not walking with the Lord at the, at the moment. And we haven't actually had any contact for years. <laughs> I'm quite sad about that, actually. The little fox has got in there, got in there. I'm not sure what I'd do about it. <laughs> if you've got any ideas, you can tell me. I thought it was a relationship that would never break. But it has at least seen me, uh, given me an understanding of the value of preserving relationships, the value of giving time. I have, a, I have another friend. I'll refer to some friends this morning. I have another friend who, uh, who C and I got to know him and his family 20 odd years ago. Um, in fact, I married, I did, a, I, married, I did a service for one of his daughters. I did a funeral for another of his daughters. That was a painful time. I did the funeral for his wife actually walked together for some years. We walked the Cotswold Way, all 105 miles of it together over a, over a three year period because I had some illness and got in the way. And this, this Christmas I thought I'm just going to go take the car to him and knock on the door. Well I did and I knocked on the door and nothing happened and I walked away and thought, John, nah, that's where he used to live. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> so on, Christmas, on the, Christmas, uh, New, Year, the New Year's service, which we didn't meet, I wrote out another card, found out where he was, nightmare, but he went in and knocked on the door, here's your card, come in. We had a lot of time together. We just do some more walking together. So just the fracture relationship has taught me the value of preserving the good relationships, because they're all gone. How do citizens of heaven behave? They recognise the danger and they guard their relationships. Part of being a citizen of heaven. They don't allow the differences to get away and they appreciate the good in one another. We'll see a little bit of that later. And they deal with issues quickly. They catch the little foxes. I believe citizens of heaven are good at catching the little foxes. They're good at recognising the early signs of discord and nipping them in the bud and dealing, dealing with them. And those of us who are married, that's a good reminder. <laughs> for an early married couple, or for a couple that's been married for a few years, <coughs> do catch the little foxes, the little things that irritate, the little things that get in the way. Because there's fruitfulness God wants every single year of our lives. The second thing, he understood all fractured relationships cause damage. There is damage caused. We'll come to the repair in a minute. And Paul, I'm struck by Paul, makes a heartfelt appeal to these, these two. He doesn't say, oh, you two just sort it out. He said, he could have said, come on, you can talk with me, just deal with it. He says, I entreat you, oh dear. And I entreat Syntyche. In other words, I earnestly ask you, please, 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 deal with this. Verse 1, he said, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, we've said a lot over this lesson, this letter, how much Paul loved these people. <laughs> how much he loved them, how much he listened, how much affection he felt towards them. And here you see it again. There's a difference. In fact, I love you so much that you owe it to get I'm going to address it. I'm even going to address it publicly. Publicly. For the good of the whole. Because I think he understood. Syntyche and Euodia, it's really important you resolve this. Because fractured relationships do cause damage. They contradict the nature of the body of Christ. If these two had worked as part of a team, they knew what a team was all about. Uh, and uh, it had damaged that. And uh, when we allow the rifts, the rifts to go unresolved in the body, the body resolved between us, the body itself is damaged. Um, Paul says, make every effort to preserve the unity of the spirit. 
make every effort, do what needs to be done. Uh, and these two girl, these two ladies had that had, that, had, that had ended. So Paul says, I entreat you, please, 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 do what you can. And I think if Paul was standing here today and he was addressing us, he said, if you have fallen out, please, please, find a way, find a way. Secondly, they are a major flaw in the church's fight against the powers of this world. Going back to our chapter 4, verse 1, stand firm in the Lord. That stand firm against some stuff. That stand firm against the opposition you have. Stand, that stand firm against the political pressure you're under. Stand firm against the cultural stuff in the world. There's plenty we have to stand against. Yeah? There's plenty we have to stand against. As citizens of heaven, we have to stand against the, more, the, the norms of the citizens of, this, of, the, citizens of, the, of the world. Don't we? There's plenty of funny ideas floating around at the moment that we have to stand against. There's plenty of there's plenty of them, but we have to stand against them in unity. You know, that, I, we, I think a number of us have been struck by, 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 by Ken's um, this morning just saying, I want to see the power of God this year. Yes, we do. But do you know what? There are powers against us who don't want the power of God to be seen. There are, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all familiar with the phrase, aren't we? United we stand, divided we fall. That's a reality. That's just, that's just a fact of life. That's true of any team. That's true of any military unit going into battle. It's true of a family. It's true of a business team. It's true of a medical team. No matter what team you're in. <laughs> and you're all in team. We're all in teams of some description. All of you. If you're, those of you who are in the workplace are a part of the team. Just how it is. You know, I'm part of a leadership team. United, we stand. Divine, we don't. Yeah. I mean, John and I have got to know each other pretty well over the last five years. We have a lot of affection for one another. And I would say a lot of respect for one another. But that can get down just like that. And if we allow ourselves to fall out, you are in trouble. You know, we had a very, very, very mild difference of opinion. It's a little thing. In the end, oh, for goodness sake. Just one of you, just do it. I said, well, I'll get John, do it your way. Not out of frustration, but for goodness sake, this is such a little thing, it's not worth it. <laughs> and you were trying. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't worth arguing about at this point. But it's the little foxes. I could have made an issue, and our relationship would be damaged. Yeah. And thirdly, they interfere with the spread of the gospel. These two women have been involved in the spread of the gospel. Help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. These two have been taken out of the team. They must have been. But Paul, the, 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 the thing to work on, the, the, what's important is the spread of the gospel. And the spread of the gospel will only go out, the power of God will only be seen through a united church, not through a divided church. These are three reasons why we must deal with broken relationships. That's why Paul says, I entreat to deal. I beg you, you owe it. I ask you earnestly. Entreat means to ask earnestly. Citizens of heaven, I think understand this. I think they understand this. Because what, the, what is there in heaven if not unity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Total unity. A, a dance that works together as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit operate in unity together. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son of can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. In heaven, there is unity. Citizens of heaven, therefore learn to walk in
Now, that doesn't, what that doesn't mean is just giving way to the strongest. <laughs> yeah? Sometimes you have to talk things out. You have to talk things out and you have to come to a point of agreement. That's really important. Otherwise, we're in a cult. I bet you are not interested in being in a cult. So being open with one another, being frank with one another, being honest with one another, you know, iron sharpening iron, that is part of it. But it must result in a place of, okay, we're agreed. Yeah? Those of us who marry understand that. Okay, don't agree with this. We haven't got the resolution yet. We're not there yet. Let's keep talking. Let's keep going. Let's keep batting this around. Let's, until we're at a point of unity. Yeah? I think citizens of heaven understand that. And lastly, all must take responsibility to repair the damage. Note how Paul here directly addresses three individuals. He says, I treat Sint- I treat Euodia. And Euodia's probably thinking, but it's her fault. I treat Syntyche, who's also saying, it's her fault, probably. <laughs> Paul makes a, a, an appeal to both as individuals. I think that's really important. You know, when there's fracture in our relationships, we both have the responsibility to find a solution. You know, it takes two to, we all know it takes two to tango. That, that goes without saying. We know that. Uh, but most, most arguments, in most arguments, both parties think they're right and the other's wrong. You know this, I mean, that's the true on the macro scale. In Gaza at the moment, I can assure you, both our parties are con- utterly convinced they're right and the other party's wrong. Utterly convinced. <coughs> How you break that, I've no idea. <laughs> if everybody in here, the wisdom of Solomon's need. But at some point, some point on the line, both sides has to own up to their side of the, their wrong in it. Uh, good thing we believe in miracles. <laughs> God, you can't break through some. And as I'm talking, you're, you may be thinking of past arguments that you've successfully resolved, praise God. You may have in mind some, some relationship in your family or your friend that you're thinking, God, you're scratching where it itches, just go away. To God, it, unity is so important that I'm not going away. And he says, you two, agree in the Lord. Find common ground. Find some place where you can agree. Just look for it. Find it, please. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not somebody who regularly falls out with people who prefer to hear. You know, over the years I have, I've had some little fisticuffs, but generally speaking, I'm I'm quite good at you know this sort of thing. At least I like to think I am, or become quite good at. Hazel was just nodding at that point because all the time I wasn't. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, but I can remember there was one when I was at Heaven School there was one relationship that got out of kilter uh, and we had to work together we had to find work together but it was not work it was just uncomfortable there was a lot of tension and of course we were both saying you're wrong you're wrong in the end I felt God said Listen, John, you're, I, was, well, I was head of the time. You're the senior partner here. You need to take the initiative. And so I did that. And so I remember sitting down with this, this person and simply saying, I'm sorry for my part of this. And fortunately, that person was gracious enough to say, John, it's not all your fault. I have something to do with this. And there were some tears. And there was some repentance. And there was some forgiveness. And actually, this relationship is now stronger than it ever was. And that's the funny thing. Those of you in medical, correct me if I'm wrong to medic, but I think it's true that a, a broken bone, once it's mended, is sometimes stronger than it was beforehand. Is that true? Or is that just an old wives' tale? I think it's sometimes. Is that right? 
Sound right. <coughs> so is that sometimes true? It can be. Yeah. It's not always, but it can be. So I would say a healed relationship actually can be can be stronger for that. Because you've made yourself vulnerable. And something of the heavenly business of repentance and forgiveness has flown. And when you touch heaven, it works. And repentance and forgiveness is a heavenly idea. Yeah? Can I, can I just say, never has underestimate the power of a heartfelt repentance. Of a heartfelt apology. I don't mean to say I'm sorry. I mean a heartfelt repentance. I would suggest most times it can only ever be responded to one way. I forgive you. Because that's a, that's a heavenly thing. That's what citizens of heaven do. However, Paul does say, if that fails, draw in somebody else. So, Abby and Gemma, Caroline, you're going to do, you're going to give us a little, a little bit of, yeah, more light hearted, excuse me, Abby, um, yes. <laughs> of how a third person might be able to help you. Thank <laughs> you. 
standing to one side observing, then was the one who stepped in with a solution. But quite good as observing, not me. But actually to get involved is good. Okay, citizens of heaven, they take the risk and they get involved. The thing is we're afraid it's all going to go past you, don't we? But uh, I would suggest we do that. Um, okay, oh, what, the last thing, one of the, one of the, one of the um, uh, Beatitudes is, blessed are the peacemakers but they will be called sons of God. In other words, they're like father. Like father, like sons. God, father, father, God is a great peacemaker when you're a peacemaker, like having yours there. It's like being a child of God. Okay, we're there. So we're called to live up uh, to our status as peacemakers. We're called to live up our status as citizens of heaven and uh, Paul says in Ephesians, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And the result is harmony comes, because peace comes. It was done well. I would suggest also with these five things, this word, just think about this word peace. Peace is often mentioned through this. It actually means peace of mind. I think as we operate the citizens of the heavens we do these things, peace of mind comes. Our mental health remains healthy. We'll open that up a little bit more <laughs> later on. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, can I just leave it there? Uh, citizens of heaven, uh, that we are, we, can we resolve to do, if, if God's been speaking to you this morning out of this, can I encourage you to resolve to take some action? If it's negative, if there's a relationship you need to repair, then can I encourage you to think, ask the Holy Spirit what do I do? What's something I can do? Is it a phone call? Is it a letter? Is it a knock on the door? Is it a card? Is it a gift? Um, is it something I need to do? And on the positive side, maybe it is just, what can I do to develop my relationship? To grow my relationships? To make them more secure? To deal with the little foxes? And it's probably, it's probably the little things. It's spending time, it's listening, it's helping, it's laughing, it's giving, it's just the little things. If the little foxes follow the vine, little things can actually preserve our relationships. And actually, just a final word, life groups, can I encourage you in your life groups to think how you develop those relationships? What are the little things you can do together? The little things. Yesterday I have Ali and Ali and Sharia are in our, Ali and Sharia are in our, that is our life group. We've known them for about a year, they've known us for about a year. And actually we're just about, just starting to get to know each other. Just starting to appreciate them as friends. I spent a happy couple of hours yesterday helping Ali and Cherie move their bees. Didn't Ali's a beekeeper. If you want to know about bees, Ali's your man. And uh, we went over to, to Crick Lane, we put them in the back of the car, we bought them. But they're now sitting in Jane and Hazel's field. So when we have our barbecue next summer, we'll have some friends there with us. <laughs> 20,000 of them. That'll be proud. The bee jokes have been flowing between us, as you can imagine. And Shuri very kindly made me two bacon sandwiches. Not one, but two bacon sandwiches. And this morning I was given a gift of honey. It's the little things that grow relationships just as it's the little foxes that's born the life. I would encourage you in your house groups, think of the little things you can do. This is literally a very sweet 